morning. Welcome back to our series on tips on weathering and painting our army tanks. Um, today we're going to have a guest, Dave Forrest, who's going to join us this morning. He's going to talk about filters and washes, and it's uh, probably a two-part, uh, two-episode series. And um, I'm just going to ask Dave, I, I'll introduce Dave. Dave Forrest is a friend of uh, Hornet Hobbies and myself for the last six or seven years. Welcome to the show, Dave. Thank you, Dave. It's great to be here this morning. I just want to ask you, Dave, um, after painting your models with the acrylic uh, base and a khaki drab or the different greens or German armor, um, before putting on a filter or a wash, do you put on any um, barrier? Do you put on, a to me, a clear coat or no. anything like that? No, no, typically, um, typically I don't. Um, and in this particular case, I used uh, Tamiya acrylics, thinned with the uh, the Gunzi leveling thinner, and I find that provides a very durable surface uh, for any filters or, or washes or any subsequent weathering uh, he might want to use. Um, so no, typically I, I, I don't put any gloss coat or matte coat varnish on there to protect the uh, to protect the paint underneath. I find these to be especially durable. Um, and I've also had good success with, um, uh, you know, the, like the MIG, the AK paints, the Vallejo paints, thinning those with the same uh, Gunsy leveling thinner. And I, provi I also find that that provides a very uh, durable finish as well. Oh, that's great. And um, as far as after those are painted with you, your Sherman is painted with acrylic paints, do you have to wait 24 hours or anything? Or do you, do you let it wick off for any length of time? Or Yeah, at, at least... The yeah, 24 hours or at least overnight to let it dry, to let everything sit, or set properly rather, um, just to, to make sure that you're not, uh, um, that everything's dried and, and, and set so that any of the products that you're applying afterwards don't attack the finish. Um, yeah, but, I, but sometimes the recesses in different vehicles are deeper than others, and sometimes, no matter what, it, it takes a little longer for paints to wick off. So, all right, well, I'll let you get started. And... Um, I'll be back in a few minutes. Thanks so much, Dave, for joining us today. Oh, my pleasure. Okay. So today we're going to talk about um, applying filters to your model um, and also go into why you would want to apply a filter. Um, so I guess the first question a lot of people have is why bother with a filter? What, is, what does a filter do for you? Uh, and in the case here, we're going to be working on this uh, Tamiya Sherman that I built up. It's just built up out of the box. I haven't done anything to it. And um, We'll show you how applying a filter, um, particularly to a tank that has a single color camouflage uh, scheme to it, <clears throat> um, help, will help um, bring some variation, some tonal variation uh, to the model um, that will um, make it kind of pop a little bit more when, when people are looking at it. And um, the, the purpose of the filter is really to slightly adjust the color, the tone of, of the base color that you're applying it to. And it'll do it in a very subtle way. And the nice thing about applying a filter is that you can really build up uh, the effect. Um, so you can start very light uh, and then put it on the model, see how you like it, see how it appeals to you. Uh, and if you want to go a little bit stronger, you can always apply another coat of the filter. So we'll go over all of that. Um, there's also different types of filters that you can apply. Um, there's a lot of great product, and you see some samples of it here uh, that I have in uh, that I have in my inventory uh, that I like to use. <clears throat> we have, um, of course, the the MIG products, which are pre-mix filters out of the bottle that you know have the perfect uh, consistency and really don't require uh, any thinning whatsoever. Uh, and then we have the same thing here from uh, from Adam Wilder's line. Uh, work very much the same way. They're they're all uh, they're all great products. And then some of you may remember um, these filters came out. Uh, I want to say probably ten plus years ago. These were the first ones that uh, at least I'm aware of that came on the market. And these were from Sin Industries. Um, but all of these are are largely the same. You can also make your own filter using oil paints. So what I've done here is I've taken uh, a few different colors and put them onto cardboard so that the linseed oil leaches out. Um, and there's different types of oil paints, and we'll, we'll talk about that in a little bit. But you can also use a very diluted um, oil paint. Just put a, a bit of oil paint into some thinner, mix it up so that it's you know just a tint of the color, and you can also use that to apply to your model. So 
you don't have to go out and buy these, um, but these are, you know, I always find that these provide more consistent results because they're, they're, they're pre-mixed. Um, the other type of filter that you can apply is what's called a dot filter, and we'll go through an example of that. And I find that's really useful for um, adjusting the tone in, in a more targeted area. Or for example, if you wanted to change the tone on a particular panel, and you wanted one side to be a little bit more reddish and the other side to be a little bit more yellow, for example, just to give some, some variation there, um, you'd have to use the dot pattern or the dot filters to get that, and I'll show you how to, how to do that later. Um, and I also find that for um, multi-camo tanks, that using the dot, the dot uh, filter method is, is really the only way to go um, because to try and brush this onto a particular um, area just you know it might leave pool marks and tide marks and it's not as uh, maybe not as easy to use as if you're working within a, a specific panel or an area of the tank okay so let's uh, yeah, let's dive in and start applying some filters okay so let's uh, let's dive into the Sherman here so as you can see um, this Sherman has been uh, modulated um, heavily uh, and it, at this point it, it looks fairly um, stark and and maybe a little bit uh, a little bit tacky as it were um, and what I hope to show you over the next little bit is how we can maybe tone some of that back um, using filters and one thing that I, that I would say is that when you're doing your, your base color and, and if you're doing modulation uh, really try and it's try and go as, as, as bright as you can as, as tacky as you can um, it, it's your model should look a little bit um, outlandish at this point and the reason for that is that through the subsequent processes of uh, filtering uh, putting washes on weathering um, etc uh, that is going to tone right down and it's very easy to tone something down it's it's a lot more difficult um, to bring it back um, so we'll um, we'll show you how to do that so what I'm going to start doing is I'm going to get my palette ready here, and we're going to start using maybe some of the uh, pre-mixed uh, filters here. And very important thing, um, a friend of mine told me to, to buy this uh, a few years ago. I was never really a big believer in the stirs, but uh, man, is this thing ever, ever critical. Um, and with these uh, pre-mixed products, it's really important that they're fully and totally mixed. Um, otherwise, um, you're going to get uh, potential, you're going to get inconsistencies and you might get, um, you know, bits of pigment and, and whatnot that, uh, uh, you know, if you don't mix it properly, it's going to make its way onto your model and it's going to, it's going to give you a, a less than a stellar finish. Okay. So first thing I do, shake it up and then I'm just going to stir this guy up here. Give it a good stir, make sure everything's mixed. Now the nice thing about these things is they're fairly easy to mix because they're mostly, uh, they're mostly thinner and a little color, a little pigment. Clean that off. And then let's, uh, I'm gonna just pull this apart. Like so. So what we'll do is we'll focus, and actually I did take the trouble and I don't know if I don't know if the camera's going to pick this up very well, but for example, so this is the base color here. So I haven't touched this, I haven't done anything to this. And then here, I just put a very, very light coat of the same uh, green for gray green um, make filter. Um, so you can see there's a very subtle variation in the tone here. This is a little bit more green, um, and maybe a little bit truer to the um, to the olive drab than than what you'd see here. And again, that's just an example of how. Um, you know, this process will, will kind of tone down the stark effect of, of your modulated model. Um, and that's really what you want to get to, right? That's uh, absolutely, uh, absolutely the right direction to go in. So on this here, I'm going to take, I'm just going to dip my brush into the, to the bottle here. I'm going to pick up a little bit of the uh, filter. And you see how I'm wiping it off? I'm trying to get most of it off the brush. And then once I've succeeded that, I'm just on paper, I'm just going to unload it just a little bit more. So you want, you want your brush just slightly moist, but not dripping wet because that, that'll be too much. So let's focus maybe 
um, on this hatch here. So I'm going to just just apply the filter like so. And that's all there is to it. So I'm going to go back in, pick up a little bit more, unload it as much as I can, unload it a little bit more on the paper here. And then, um, and, and, and what I like to do is I like, to, you can, if you wanted to, you could do the whole model in the same color. Um, but I like to mix and match and, and give um, different tonal varieties to, 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 to different uh, panels, because I find that look pleasing, because it's, you know, in some ways, a, a single color camouflage is one of the most difficult to do, because it, it's hard to make it really jump out, as opposed to a, a multicam uh, or multicolor cam uh, finish, uh, and I think this is uh, this is a good easy way uh, of kind of getting around that and having slight tonal varieties in different parts of your tank. And again, there's you know a lot of uh, you know there's a lot of people will say, well, that's not realistic. If you look at a real tank, it doesn't look like that. But it's not a real tank; it's a model, and and it's uh, you know there's a certain amount of artistic license and interpretation. Plus, you're also trying to do whatever you can to trick the eye, as it were. Um, again, you, you, you want um, people to look at your model and to notice different things about it. And if you're, you know, if you're the type of person or type of modeler that likes to go to shows and likes to compete and enter in their models, um, and, and Dave has told me this a number of times, and he's absolutely right, that it's absolutely critical that you try and keep the, the, the person there looking at your model, whether it's a judge or whether it's a spectator, um, because that's going to generate interest. So for example, if I look at this T10 that I'm doing here, it's a single color green, um, but this here, this panel here has a, has a green tint to it. So I used a green filter on this panel, and on this panel here, I used a, a yellow or a tan filter. So just a very subtle difference, but when you, when you look at the the complete model and you stand back from it it makes it it makes it jump out it gives you it gives a certain pop to the model and i think um these days it's, it's really about how the you know it's really the finishes on the model um you know you have to build them you have to build them true and straight um and it's great if you can you know add photo etch and, and whatnot to enhance the model but if you don't have a good paint job on top of that that draws the eye to it all that hard work really goes for for nothing unfortunately so and that's you know in, in my mind that's just as humans we're, we're all kind of wired that way that we're very visually oriented um, anyway so we'll uh, we'll get back to the uh, we'll get back to the Sherman here so I'm going to continue with my green and I might go back over real quickly and just give another coat to the same panel here all right and then, you know what, maybe I want to do this doohickey, for lack of a better term here. I should know the I should know what that is, but I don't. Um, go back and get some more. Again, on some, it's critical that you unload it, and you want very little, because you can always go back and add more. If it's too much, it's going to be hard to recover from. Um, and maybe let's, you know, kind of do this whole panel here, or this, had this uh, driver hatch. Or gunner hatch, I guess. So I don't know if, that, if you can pick this up, but already, so here you can already tell that there's a difference in this tone versus the, un, the untouched tone here, where I haven't done, I haven't applied any filters to this area here. So this already looks a little bit greener. And I think if you look at this uh, part versus this part on this side here, which hasn't been touched, again, it's a little, a little darker and a little greener. Same thing with this hatch. So I'll just go through and pick out different hatches. And what I might do is I might ro maybe rotate it on the side and maybe attack one of these um, applique armor pieces here. So let's do this first one here. So I'll just take it. Right, and you don't have to be overly precise, but try and keep it off other, other parts. Right. Maybe I'll go up just a little bit more here. I'll do this front fender here. Right? 
And again, you know, with the, the Tamiya paint underneath, as you can see, I'm applying this on. It's not attacking the paint. It's not pulling anything off. Um, you know, the Tamiya paints are, are very durable. I love to use that, that Gunsy leveling thinner. That's hard to find. Um, but if you can find it, grab it um, because it's absolutely amazing stuff. But I think the, um, uh, the Tamiya lacquer thinner works just as well. And, uh, and I've also, in the past, I've also worked with using the X20 thinner with a little bit of alcohol. That works fine too. I just, I just think the, the Tamiya paints are the most um, hassle-free paints to use uh, in, in my experience. Um, but I also really like using the, uh, the Vallejo and the MIG uh, acrylics as well. And I was really surprised to find that you could thin them or how well they thinned with the, uh, with the Gunsy leveling thinner. Um, so that's always another, another good option as well. So I might go back here and maybe just you know, do this, cover this guy off here. Maybe this rear panel here, do this one as well. So you see, I'm just not putting a whole lot of thought into this, just sort of doing it as I go. Oh, I've got a little bit more on that, but that's fine. That's the nice thing about doing them in light coats is that if you do spill over, it's you know, certainly not the end of the world. Let me just pick up a few more things. To do. Maybe, maybe do the front, one of the front armor pieces. So if you remember, we put a little bit of green filter on this hatch. You know, maybe let's go and put. So instead of doing it on this piece of the uh, added armor here, the applique armor, let's put it down here on this other piece on the opposite side, just to get that going. Like that. Just to give it a little bit of tone. So let's. Let's put this color away. Now let's pick um, another one. Let's try this brown for desert yellow. And then, again, they, they kind of always recommend the colors you should you should use them on. And you know this will work very nice on a on a desert yellow type of finish. But you can you can really apply them uh, almost on any color. And again, the nice thing of it's another reason why you want to do the light coats, right? So let's shake this guy up again. And very important to mix them up. Open this up. Give it another good mix. Clean that off. Clean tool is a happy tool. Put that down. And let's, um, yeah, let's just. Make sure we get the other color off the brush here. So I like to use a, a little aluminum palette here just to have my thinners ready. So I'll have a, a little bit of thinner that I use to clean the paint with, um, and then I'll have some clean thinner. I'll get to that when we start using the uh, the oil paints to create uh, to create our own filters. So clean that off. So dip this in there, and again, the same process, right? Try and unload as much as possible. I mean, you buy one of these things, they'll, they'll, they'll last you forever. Unload it onto the paper, and let's start attacking uh, some other panels here. So let's do, um, so this, again, this is one panel that we hadn't touched before with the green. Let's start doing that one. Back in, get some more. Load it. Take it off. And maybe let's do uh, let's do this other. So I'm jumping around here. Let's do this other piece of armor here. Okay. Yeah, let's go back and get some more. Yeah, this looks pretty. Um, let's do this. Maybe the other hatch here. All right. Uh, let's maybe go back and so we did this one in green. Let's maybe do this one in the brown. Let's go back and give that rear panel another coat. Because you're doing them so light, you can go back and add another coat fairly, because it dries fairly quickly, so. Oh, well, you might want, I mean, usually I'd probably wait a little bit longer than this, but. 
for the purposes of the video. Uh, maybe give this another coat. So I think yeah, we'll let that dry for a bit. Maybe uh, maybe we'll do maybe we'll do this panel here. So again, I'm just kind of following. Oops, that's probably a little bit more than I wanted. So I'm not listening to my own advice. Take that off, unload it, put that on. And the nice thing about, um, I mean, I, I think this Sherman is a great pal to work on for, for explaining this because, you know, it has the nicely defined section. So you can really, you know, it's very easy to apply uh, the filter to each individual area of the tank. So I think if you, let's put that aside. So you can see here we applied the green filter. So it has a bit of a green tinge. Here we applied the brown filter, a couple of coats of that. So it has a kind of a darker, browner tinge. Um, and then on this side here, we haven't applied anything. So I think, you know, hopefully the camera can pick up that, you know, there, there is a slight variation in the tone here. That's exactly what you're going for. And, you know, some people might be happy with that. Some might want to go a little bit more and let this dry fully and go back and put another coat on. Um, but I think for now, we'll leave that as is. And let's look at... Um, let's look at making making our own filter. Um, or actually, no, let's try something. Let's try something different. So I was so before I said that these filters are typically designed for a particular color or group of colors. So here I have um, an AK filter that's made for it's it's blue, and it's made for Panzer Gray. This obviously isn't Panzer Gray, but hey, let's let's put some on in, on one of the panels and let's see what it looks like. Once we do this, we'll go to the uh, we'll go to the oil filters. Okay, so we're going to try a few other colors. So uh, again, um, let's look at using blue for Panzer Gray. Again, uh, remember the folks that made this filter probably well, we didn't have in mind applying this um, to a, an olive green model or an olive drab model. So I say again, same thing, unload it, and let's maybe do this guy here. And I think you can see right away that there is a, a change in this, like the bluish tinge to that color. Which I don't think you'd want to do on large areas of an olive drab tank, but maybe, you know, one or two things here and there. Um, like, you know, maybe let's, let's put that maybe just on the top of this um, periscope cover here, just to give it a little something different there. And again, just, you know, no, no area on the tank is too small to give, to give that type of attention to. So let's, um, let's, um, let's clean that and then let's use maybe a more traditional color. So now we'll try one of the, uh, the wilder so this is uh, Adam Wilder's, uh, what is that, gray-brown filter. So the same type of thing. The nice thing about the Wilder products is that they're in that bigger bottle, so it's a little bit harder to, to knock over. And I've certainly, I mean, who hasn't had that happen to them? I certainly have. <laughs> so let's look at, um, let's do, Let's do this thing here. So this is the gray-brown filter. Uh, maybe let's pick up a little bit more on that. So again, you can see it kind of tones down the underlying uh, base color. So well, let's do another panel. We'll do one more, and then we'll look at using the oils to create your own filters. Let's do. Um, let's do this guy here. Maybe one of these armored fuel caps, right, just to give it a little different something. 
So if you um, let's uh, let's get to those, but first let's give this a quick dry. So if you you're moving in a hurry, which sometimes you do, I just um, accelerated the drawing using the uh, the hair dryer. So let's go back with uh, let's say the uh, where's the green? Where'd that get to? So Dave, when you're when you're adding the filters, could you spend um, say an afternoon doing it, or is it a process throughout a week? Or um, like you don't obviously try to do your whole thing in a half hour setting uh, or a seating rather. No. This this whole process could take days, correct? Yeah, it, it could. Uh, it depends um, how dark you want to go because you're you're working in light coats. So if you want a very stark finish, then you know, you're going to have to apply a coat, let it dry, apply another coat. Um, but typically, for me, typically I find I can do this, you know, in, in one or two, one to two hour sessions. Yeah. Um, and again, it depends on the size of the model and how deep you're going. But um, so let's go back and apply another color, another filter of the green here on this panel. And I think even with that second coat, you're really seeing, you're really seeing the difference there. So we'll go back and I think we applied it here. So let's put another, maybe pick up a little bit more filter there. Again, building up the, building up the, the layers, you know, several light coats, light layers is the right way to go. And there's always a tendency to try and put more on so you get an immediate effect, but that can, that can ruin the finish. So just, so I guess it's important when we put our acrylic paint olive drab on the tank, I would assume you, you're using a lot of thinner so that, yes, you know, um, I don't know what your mixture is. I uh, Most of our viewers know that my mixture is about 70% thinner, 30% paint. Because we build up so many layers, I would assume that your olive drab coat is mixed with a lot of thinner. To yeah, about the with. same, about the same ratio. And it's always, it's always, again, it's always easier to build up and it allows you to get, you know, if, if you go back to the, the finish here, you can see here where there's a bit of a, a, a graduation of, of colors here um, in terms of, you know, how it's a little bit darker here and it gets a little bit lighter towards the top. You know, if you're not using light coats, you know, it's going to be a little bit tricky to do. Yeah. I mean, for our viewers, um, I think Dave and I are from the same school. You know, by the end of our model, we probably have seven or eight layers of paint on our models. But because we use so much thinner, um, we never lose any detail. The, the hatches, the nuts and bolts, and the small little details on kits today, as you can see by Dave's models here, um, they certainly don't lack detail, even though there's seven or eight layers of paint on them. I would imagine that the two of us basically paint with dirty thinner. <laughs> Yeah, and to be fair, I think I learned that from you, or I'm sure I learned that from you. So that's where, that's where I I picked that uh, that particular tip up. So let's go back over with the with the brown. Take a little bit more. And again, this is I mean, I mean this is as Dave says, this is a hobby. It's hobby time. Don't uh, you know nothing to get uh, stressed out over. Just you know work work gradually, lightly. You know, it's always a good thing to, to do something and then maybe take a, you know, take a bit of a break, walk away from the model and come back. And sometimes you'll, you'll look at things with a bit of a different perspective. Sometimes when something's going not quite the way you want it to go, there's a tendency to, to want to rush and correct the problem. And uh, sometimes that can, that can put you in more, uh, in more hot water. I think that's happened to all of us. So I think you can see with the application of the different types of filters, you can start to see that there's very subtle changes in tones um, on the uh, on the chassis here of this of the Sherman, or the hull of the Sherman rather. Um, so I think what we'll do now is we'll let's look at making our own filter from oil paints. And Dave, the um, the filters they'll dry flat or uh, eggshell kind of color or. Uh, depends on the filter, but generally flat. And I find um, the other thing that's important to note too is that I find 
that the, the surface that you're putting it on really needs to be flat, ideally flat, eggshell, kind of at the limit. Because um, if you're trying to put this on a bit of a glossy surface, it's just going to pool. Right? So the, the nice thing about you working with a flat finish is that the, the finish itself kind of sucks the, the filter um, right. into, the, into, the, into the, the paint, as it were. Yeah, I'm, I'm usually painting in an eggshell or, uh, you know, towards the flat, not completely flat, of course, but yeah, I don't, um, I never gloss my model before going to these steps, that's for sure. And I suppose these same, because filters are so thin, I know, Dave, that you also build airplanes, so if we were doing the wing of a B-17, all of drab, most of these, this application of the filters would be similar. Oh uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. Whether it's a tank or a plane, it's um, it's really up to the individual modeler's taste. So for the so I so I took the liberty of putting some oil paints on cardboard. And again, when you're using um, your your typical oil paints, um, and I like to use um, I like to use the uh, Aptone five hundred two paints. And the reason why is that these. These are designed specifically for, for modeling, and they, they contain a very fine pigmentation. So when you're doing things like if you're making your own washes or you're making your own filters, um, it's important to have a very fine pigment and paint. And there's others like the, that you can get from your art store like Windsor & Newtons and whatnot um, that I've used in the past, but since these have come onto the market, I, I find yeah. these are, are kind of give you a good experience every single time and are fairly consistent. And they're consistent. very good value. They're, they're price you know, have a great price well, you, point to them, and there's a lifetime worth of paint. Yeah, there, you, at least you, you buy one of these tubes, and you'll be able to give it to your grandkids. Yes. So, so the the and there's different types of oils that have um, that are on the market. So you have these are more your your the five hundred two are more your traditional type of oil paints, um, and in that you really need to put them onto cardboard to the bleed out the the linseed oil, um, and and just really have a, a more concentrated paint. Um, Otherwise, that can you know having too much linseed oil in there can kind of um, you know give you less than stellar results in your finishes. But then um, Adam Wilder came onto the market with these um, these oils, and these are very these are different. Um, and actually, you have to kind of shake them up almost um, because they're a lot more liquidy. And if you put them onto cardboard, they'll be bone dry in about thirty minutes. So. If you're going to use those, um, I would put them onto a non-porous surface. And it's important to shake the, the Wilder products, isn't it, Dave? Yeah, because there's a lot of um, oil or... It's almost thinner. like a humbrol paint, isn't it? Yeah, like a very thick, yeah, it's like a very thick uh, humbrol paint, exactly right. Um, and yeah, so if you put it onto something porous, like a piece of cardboard, it'll 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 be dry. And, but if you do, if you leave it onto something that's not porous, I mean, it'll it'll stay wet for days, um, yeah. which is nice. So let's so for the ones that we're going to make, let's pick a couple of really, <clears throat> really. Let's pick maybe an orange. So this is the <clears throat> this is the faded dark yellow. Which I which I love using on uh, anything that has a tan or a, like a, a German Dunkelgelb type finish. Um, so let's mix that up. So you can see, I'm just making my own my own uh, filter here. So when you so how do you know how uh, how do you know how thick to make it? Basically, if you're pulling it up the sides of the of the mixing tray here. You know, it should be very translucent, just like that. I, mean, I think that's pretty good. Now let's clean that off. Now let's make, um, let's use this magenta here. Again, from the 502 Aptelling range. And let's make, now you're probably thinking, why on earth <laughs> would, you, would <laughs> you use this color on your military armored vehicle? Um, well, I'll show you. And again, the key is to go light. And then let's use maybe. And, and to our viewers, if if you're out and about in North America, different shows. Um, I suggest that Scott Primo is one of the prime 
guys for painting olive drab and, and Dave Forrest is, is the other. Two of the top modelers in North America for sure. And um, so when you're at the shows, everybody's normally wearing a, a name tag. Look up Scott Primo or, or Dave Forrest and find out where their models are on the tables and zero in on them because they're gems to study. Uh, they're just beautiful. And um, yeah, don't don't hesitate when you're walking around a show. If you see a model you like, find out who built it and 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 ask him about it. Ask him how he applied all these different things. Most of our modeling community and neighborhood are fantastic guys to speak to, and they'll always um, come forward with you know how to do things. So don't hesitate if you see these models at different shows. Um, to ask the guys who built them, how they how they got to that point. It's a benefit to us all, so. Yeah, carry on Dave, show us what you're gonna do with <laughs> these great colors. Okay, so let's, uh, so this is, uh, this is very much an experimentation here. So let's, um, and again, the, one of the great areas of your vehicle to experiment on is the underside. Uh, and the reason for that is because not a lot of people are gonna look at it. And chances are you're probably going to cover this up in, in mud and, and pigments uh, and other weathering effects at, at a later time. So let's look at, um, so again, I, I think I mentioned earlier, um, this panel here has a, has a brown filter on it. This one has the green filter on it. This one doesn't have anything. So let's look at picking, let's pick this magenta one here. Because I'm sure that's the one everybody's looking at to say, how is this going to work? So unload it and... And you can see right away that there is a change in the tone. And I have to say, it doesn't look that bad. No, it looks very, very good. And you can see right away that there's a difference between this panel here, which is which had the green, uh, the premixed green filter from uh, from Mig, from Mig, I believe, yeah. And this is the one I just made from the magenta oil paint. So let's clean our brush. And, and guys, always experiment. Um, like Dave said, on the bottom of your tank, it's it's painted with the exact same paint that the that the hull is going to be painted with. So the results are going to be the same once you get to the top of the tank. So make sure that you use the bottom of your tanks as uh, as sort of test beds. I mean, as you guys know, I, I'm very pro on painting the bottom of the tanks and and weathering the devil out of them so um, don't hesitate to experiment you're not going to screw up your tank because you're going to put all kinds of uh, pigments on down the road so absolutely right dave and here here i'm applying the uh, the, the dark yellow filter the orange filter i guess and again that looks that looks pretty good let's go back and maybe let's use one of these bogies here let's go back with this magenta filter and just to give it just a little different tonal variation now again you're probably going to cover this up with a lot of mud and pigment and whatnot in subsequent sessions but it's a great, great place to test. And the other thing is about what Dave's doing. It, it's they're basic techniques, but advanced results. So don't. Um, other than time, Dave isn't doing anything that he probably didn't learn in kindergarten. <laughs> so um, it's all colors. It's all colors. Is if, if I mean, if you guys look at the palette that he's using here on the table. I mean, that's no different than what we painted when we were youngsters. So, um, like I say, basic techniques, but advanced results for sure. So, so let's get, now that we think we have some, these are safe to apply. Let's look at applying this on a more visible area of the tank. Uh, let's pick out maybe one of these, this cheek armor here. So again, this is the magenta filter. I've unloaded it. 
I'll do this in the magenta. Maybe I need to pick up a little bit more paint there, or a little bit more filter. When you make your own filter, the important thing is, is as there's as it's sitting in the tray, you really got to keep mixing it because the the paint will tend to settle a little bit quicker. Let's clean that off. Let's go. Let's pick. Let's pick up some of that yellow. And again, using using this this orange yellow thing, we'll add a little bit of warmth to the color. So you can see that there's already a bit of it just with two, you know, one light coat on each side. This of the magenta, this of the the orange. Um, you know how that's changed a little bit. And again, maybe hard for the camera to pick that up, but I can certainly see it here with my naked eye. <laughs> let's go back. Actually, maybe let's hit this with a hairdryer real quick. So here's Scott Primo's uh, Sherman, uh, Italian theater of war. And it might be hard to pick up on the camera, especially if you're going to use your cell, but um, on a big screen, you can easily see the filters that Scott has used on here and where the breakup lines are, where the armor, uh, different shaped castings on the armor. But you can see how there's three or four, five shades of olive drab on this Sherman tank. And Dave is going through the process of getting there. And, and this is just the finished product, but Dave Sherman orders a T10 as you can see, they really bring out on these olive drab finishes. So don't panic, guys, if you're building Russian armor or, um, or khaki drab armor that, um, that you're stuck in one color and feel, um, you know, that you can't go anywhere with it. As you can see, there's five or six colors on these tanks at least, and they're basically all of drab tanks. So don't hesitate to talk to these guys at your local shows if they're about. Scott Primo is from Minnesota. He's not here in Ontario like Dave is. Those of us visiting here in Ontario, Dave attends most of the model shows. And Scott certainly gets around, certainly in Chicago and the different amp shows. So don't hesitate to tap these guys on the shoulder. They're terrific guys and be glad to tell you some of the steps and how they uh, execute their greens. So these two guys are, like I say, the two of the top olive drab guys in North America. So um, take advantage of seeing their models and talking to them and asking them questions about how they got there. And I'll switch it over to Dave. Dave's gonna add some pretty neat colors to his Sherman. Yeah, so I'm just carrying on. So what I've done here is I've used, uh, so if you remember correctly on the filters that we're making, this is the um, this is the Adam Wilder line of oils, the shadow, the brown shadow that I've mixed with um, thinner. And I just applied it to this side of the hatch. So this is, uh, this is un, uh, untinted. This is tinted with that uh, shadow brown. And then what I'm going to do here is with this periscope cover, I'm going to go over that in the magenta, just to make it, just to make it stand out a bit. Unload that a little bit more. So I'm using a smaller brush here because it's a smaller area. And again, you can see that there's already a bit of a contrast between the brown filter that I uh, applied here versus the magenta filter that I have here. So if I want to go a little bit stronger, I can pick up some more. And again, because you're, it's a small area and you're doing fairly light coats, you know, you can go right after it. Or you can pull out the old hair dryer and use that in between. But already you can see there's a difference there. And then for giggles, why don't we go in and do the other side of the hatch in the orange. Again, always gotta when you're mixing your own mix mix it up in the palette every time you go to it because it does tend to settle 
quicker than the products that are pre-mixed out of the bottle. And Dave, these uh, homemade recipe for filters, the amount of thinner is probably about a 90 to 10 ratio, I guess. Or more, even, and then probably a 20, 20 to one ratio. So like a 95 to 95% thinner to 5% paint. Yeah, 90 to 95% if, if we want to be specific about things. And if you go back and look at the cheek armor here, again, I did another couple of coats of the magenta here and the orange here, and you can see there is a difference. Now, that may be too stark for, for some people's liking, um, but again, you can, always, you can always tone this back with subsequent finishes. And, and one easy way of doing that, so let's say you... You go through your, your turret here and you continue on the process where you're applying different, um, you know, very vibrant color filters to different areas. And let's say you look at it and you say, well, that's really, that really stands out too much. An easy way to kind of bring all of that back is either you can use um, another filter, like a green filter to bring it all back, or spray on a very, very thin coat of your of your olive drab paint. And, that, and it's the same type of thing, it's really, 5% paint uh, to 95% thinner, just mist it on to kind of bring everything together. And that's what, I think filters have a couple of different purposes. One, so the way I've been using them here, it's really to kind of um, accentuate different parts of the model with, with different tones so that it kind of draws the eye. Um, for example, you know, you may look at the modulated tank that you've done or the, or, or the, the, the paint job that you've done from a, from a modulation standpoint and, and look at it and say, well, that's way too stark. That's way too stark for my liking. Um, you can use a filter over the whole thing to bring it all together and, and bring it all back. Um, and in fact, using, you know, if I look at this um, Panzer IV Lang here, um, it's, it's, you know, it's your, your typical German tritonal uh, camouflage and I used a, a brown filter to kind of bring everything together because when I painted and modulated the camouflages on there, it was very bright and very stark. And I did that on purpose because I knew that subsequent filters and washes and weathering and streaking and all that stuff will kind of bring all of that down. And I said at the you know the very beginning of the video that it's always better to start from a place where you know it's it's very bright and it's very um, you know it's very strong. And then you can always work on toning it down. It's a lot easier to tone something down than it is to bring it back up and, uh, and make it pop, so. Fantastic, Dave. That's so really I, great. So I think that, uh, I think that concludes the, uh, the, uh, the filter piece of this thing. Well, thanks so much for joining us this morning, Dave. It's fantastic. Your Sherman looks awesome. And I, just one other question. If we were going to do a, say, a Commonwealth, uh, Sherman, which is the shades of green are slightly different. The process is the yeah, same, I isn't think, it? Yeah, I, I think it is. I mean, I think even if you were doing um, <clears throat> like a dark yellow German tank, you could use the same the same process. You might, you know, with the yellows, you might want to use more, you know, more reds, more oranges. Like these would, I think these would have a much um, stronger effect on on a, on a lighter color paint, like a like a dark yellow paint uh, finish. So. Um, but again, you know, just from where it was when we first started this to where it is now, even though we haven't done every single panel yet, just, you know, we just selected a few, you can already see that there's some variations uh, in there that, and they're very slight and very subtle, but that's what you're, that's what you're going for. And again, if you want to go stronger, you can always add more, uh, more coats um, to the filters. Uh, and again, remember that when you start doing your, your washes and um, other subsequent weathering effects like streaking and whatnot, but uh, that'll start to kind of tone that down and it won't be as stark, so. So Dave, if um, we basically covered off a lot of World War II here, the greens for the T-34s and Russian armor, obviously um, a little bit of Commonwealth, American, tri-color, but obviously there's a another major player in all of this, which is Panzer Gray. With, with the filters, um, would the same great colors, these vibrant colors, still apply I, I, on, on Panzer Gray? I think so. Um, you, you, again, if you want to 
uh, if you want to be a little bit more traditional, you probably stick with you know kind of the blue and gray and brown filters. Um, but I think like, and I think this is a great palette to work with. I think if you were to do that, maybe use like a blue filter on the main body and then highlight these uh, engine louver covers with you know like a like a magenta or or, or a, a, an orange or you know a bright blue type of filter or a bright green. Uh, or even a red, you know, just to give it just a slight, because again, they're very, they're very thin, they're very right. light, right? Yep. So, yeah, the the possibility of making a mistake is almost zero because we yeah. we could just because, because the effect, of the thin coats. It's a, it's a very subtle effect that you build up. So yeah, I think, it, but it, it's to everybody's individual taste. Some people might feel safe just going with you know kind of your traditional filter, and I've yeah, done that paint on previous gray and exactly. I've done that too on previous builds where I've just used one color. Um, but I really like the I really like the effect that having multiple color filters on on a vehicle does because it kind of breaks up the monotony of that single that yeah. single color finish. Right? So I think what what you've done on your T10 or your Sherman here, even though this is a single color, we, we could still turn this Panzer gray into probably six or seven shades of Panzer gray just through the filter. Yeah, yeah, and that'll draw the eye to it, and that'll you know if somebody's looking at your at your vehicle, they're going to spend more time looking at it because oh look at that, that's a little bit different from that, and then whatever other. Yeah, you know, weathering or fuel stains or whatnot you've got there will just add to that. Yeah, it would just come alive on the table. Well, I want to thank you for coming, Dave. I really My appreciate pleasure. it. Thank you for having me. And I hope you're going to come back soon. Anytime. Okay, Thank thanks you. so much.